All right, so here's something I wanted to use to kind of showcase TI versus TE thinking and usage. Uh, a little abstract, kind of go with me on this, but basically it's sort of using Plato and Aristotle as examples of this, okay? Um, really these two philosophers are good examples of really just how all this works, okay? Plato being very much more the TI user and Aristotle being more of the TE user. So for those who don't know, we're talking about two ancient Greek philosophers who were polymaths, people who really studied a lot of different things. Um, they went beyond just being a philosopher. They, they dabbled in a lot of sciences and art and various things like that but it's how they go about it that's the point how they go about organizing their thoughts organizing their view of the world and so on that kind of shows you the difference between more of a ti form of thinking versus a te form of thinking um in the world of socionics i really think that a lot of socionics whether it did so deliberately or coincidentally a lot of it probably has more to do with philosophy and philosophical thinking as the basis for its definitions of information elements rather than staying very closely true to Carl Jung and what Carl Jung wrote. Uh, I think a lot of socionics really started with Carl Jung and what he wrote, but they kind of veered off somewhat seeing Carl Jung as not quite getting it quite right. And they kind of focused a lot more on philosophical thought and, um, Okay, anyway, I think that's enough intro. So I'm going to give this a shot, see if this works. Some people really get this or not. Um, let's just give it a go and see what happens. So let's start with sharing the screen. Okay, cool. So here's a little video. Play some of this from Crash Course. What is this, guys? Crash Course? Whatever. Anyway, talking about Plato and Aristotle. So if I can get it to work, we'll jump right in here who is ignorant of geometry. Plato based his own philosophy on geometric laws. He taught a Pythagoras-inspired idealism or a theory of nature based on perfect abstractions, rules of which real-world stuff could only ever be imperfect examples. So Plato had to fit his observations to his theory. So right then and there, right, what he's saying is that Plato used a lot of uh basing his philosophy on these abstractions, on these rules, on these systems and so on, in which nature would only be an imperfect view of the theory, okay? This is the TI form of it. This is following creating a theory, a structure that is elegant in its design, kind of mathematically perfect. Everything goes here, 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 and there, you know? And when we observe nature, nature is this imperfect representation that we're trying to sort of fit into our structure, fit into our overall view of everything, right? You could argue that socionics kind of does the same thing, that you have uh, this very TI'd structure with all of these information elements, all of these functions going in specific spots, okay, for each type, right? If you took an ESFP, they're supposed to have SE at the dominant, and then they're supposed to have this FI in the creative position, and then they're supposed to have FE as a demonstrative. And then, you know, and then everything needs to line up just perfectly. And then based on that perfect lineup, that's going to determine how well they get along or not get along with certain other types. It's all based on this abstract, very symmetrically beautiful model. But do we really always see that in reality? It's a big question mark, okay? So Plato is doing more of this TIing sort of stuff. That idealism is one of the reasons people think of Plato as more of a philosopher than a scientist. Plato built on the work of the pre-Socratic schools, but he developed a more complete way of looking at the natural world than they did. And his students took off in search of solutions, even as they changed his underlying theory. The only Greek who wrote more philosophy than Plato was Plato's own star student and rival, 
Aristotle. Compared to Plato's idealistic abstractions, Aristotle's philosophy makes more common sense. His ideas are based on empirical evidence. He observed the world and then came up with a theory that explained it. This order of operations is at the heart of modern scientific practices. Aristotle was from Macedonia in the north of Greece, but he studied at Plato's academy in Athens for 20 years until Plato died. Afterward, Aristotle took a lucrative gig. King Philip II of Macedonia hired him as tutor to his son, Alexander. And you know this particular Alexander, he decided to conquer the entire Earth. Before age 30, he ruthlessly conquered much of Asia, Africa, and Europe, ruling over more area than anybody until Genghis Khan. Aristotle's influence on Alexander the Great reminds us that science is always social. From the very beginning, scientists have served bad, heartless dudes. Aristotle, a man who literally wrote the book Ethics, pushed his most famous pupil to invade Persia, kill barbarians, and become a brutal warlord. After Alexander died young, Aristotle went back to Athens to start his own school, the Lyceum. The Lyceum was pretty different from Plato's Academy. Because Aristotle liked plants and liked to walk and talk, his school wasn't in a building, but a grove of trees outside the city. And his school was called the peripatetic, meaning walkie, and thus informal, not like the academy. It was during the Lyceum years that Aristotle probably wrote many of his most famous works, including Metaphysics, On the Heavens, On the Soul, which is actually an amazing book of protobiology meets psychology, and his school's highly influential set of textbooks on natural philosophy called Physics. How did Aristotle answer our big questions about physics, such as what was stuff and where are we? He posited a complete system joining the elements and the heavens. This became the basis for European thought about the physical world for 2,000 years. Let's compare Aristotle's system to his mentor Plato's in this episode's Thought Bubble. For Plato, the cosmos was perfect. It had perfect rules that could be studied, and all cosmic stuff was made up of atoms that were perfectly geometric, platonic solids, each creating one element. Tetrahedrons of fire, cubes of earth, octahedrons of air, icosahedrons of water, and dodecahedrons as the shape of the whole universe, like a giant celestial set of D&D &D dice. Plato's theory of the heavens stated that the wandering stars, that is the planets, followed a path of uniform circular motion. You see, the wandering stars must move in perfect circles since the cosmos is orderly. Ah, but this one is moving backwards. Plato's students could see that Mars, for one, seemed to jump backwards, showing retrograde motion. Plato didn't really have an explanation. European astronomers would spend the next 2,000 years meticulously trying to solve this problem, and they would end up learning a lot in the process. How did Aristotle build on Plato's system? Aristotle's cosmology was abstract too, but he attempted to make sense of observations about the world. He crossed those same four elements, plus a new anti-void called the ether, with four physical sensations, hot and cold, dry and wet, and used these to explain everything. Earth was the heaviest element, so it was the center of the cosmos. Water was lighter than Earth, so oceans rested on top of the Earth, so far so good. Air's natural state is is above water, that also checks out. Fire is on top of air, which is a little weird, but it does go up, I guess. And way out past these four terrestrial spheres, out past the moon, spun the stars, acting according to their nature as ethereal, or perfect circle-moving objects. And nowhere, anywhere in this theory, was a void. Nature abhors a vacuum. In Aristotle's cosmos, all of the elements were actively trying to get back to their natural state. Why did flames rise? They were just trying to get back to the fiery celestial realm above the air. Thanks, Thought Bubble. From the pre-Socratics to Plato to Aristotle, we've ended up with a bunch of spheres inside. Okay. All right, let's uh, do a recap on there. So what were we seeing there? We were seeing that Plato, again, had a very neatly organized view of stuff, um, of everything in the universe and so on. Everything kind of went perfectly. He viewed the universe as perfect. Everything moves in this perfect way. Um, and it kind of shows like even some of his students and some people would kind of notice that, hey, when we actually observe the cosmos and we observe things, things seem to actually go against your model. It goes against the system, this perfect system that you have in mind. Not everything seems to neatly conform. Why is that? A lot of times there is no exact answer on that, right? Meanwhile, Aristotle is going about it in the other direction. He is looking first out into 
the world, into the universe and so on, seeing and dealing with things that we can actually observe and we can actually see. He's starting from that premise, what you can empirically see and observe to be happening. And then from that, you begin to maybe theorize and speculate as to how these things are interacting and how they're working out, right? So in the case of Plato and in the case of many TI users, they're kind of you could say being introverted, going in their head to create some kind of a model, a structure, a philosophy, a system that is as perfect as possible, where everything consistently lines up, everything has its place, everything goes here and there. And then they just sort of trying to get things in their actual external world to fit into the model. Everything goes here and everything is categorized neatly and so on. But there will be glitches. There's going to be these areas where, you know what, reality just doesn't always fit into your model so neatly. There's certain areas that just don't work. TE is doing it the other way around. They're not building the model first. First, they're actually observing what's going on. Now that they've seen it and they're seeing how things appear to be working, then based on that, they come up with some kind of explanation that puts it all together. One can be seemingly more static in the TI model. You've already built it, it's been created, and you're just trying to fit things in as best you can. The other seems like you have no structure quite yet done, but rather you're observing things. And as you're seeing stuff, you're generating ideas on what that could be and why. And then you're kind of like updating your system, kind of going, oh, I think it's actually because of this. Well, it turns out since we saw that, well, then maybe it's because of this reason. So let's now put that there and maybe we'll kind of erase something else and put it here. And so you can see how TI looks more static and complete already, whereas TE looks less complete and is more continuously sort of updating based on observation, on empirical information that you're taking on, right? Um this is why some people can sometimes look at TI as this introverted form of thinking in my own head sort of thinking versus TE where you're doing more of this. I'm observing the outside world first and gaining external information first, then trying to reason out what is working and what is not working. Okay. That's one way you can kind of look at all this stuff. Um, uh yeah, pretty much. Uh, I think it was interesting that it was even mentioned that in terms of the style of Plato, some said that they looked at Plato as being more of a philosopher rather than a scientist, because he seemed to spend more time indoors, just thinking about it, just contemplating how these things might work out, and then creating some kind of a model or a system in his head, theoretically, completely theoretically, just reasoning his way to an explanation. Whereas Aristotle was outside, walking around, observing nature itself directly and seeing what it does, not forming any thoughts yet, just observing it, see what it does, marking down what seems to be happening. And then after that, you're coming to some kind of a conclusion. You're coming to some kind of explanation as to why you're seeing what you're seeing, right? Um, so very T-I-T-E, I think it's safe to say both these individuals were intuitive types, you know, so we're probably looking at two NTs more than likely, right? Um, but one is very much using the TI and the other is very much using the TE. So hopefully that was a nice illustration for some people trying to discuss TI, TE, what it looks like, where it comes from. Um, Plato and Aristotle are good examples. You could look at their philosophy and how they write about things and you can see a clear difference. Um you can see how some of the typology systems are kind of more in line with that Plato-like style versus others are more in line with that Aristotle-like style. Most of the scientific things we do are more in that Aristotle-like style. So big five stuff. I would argue that um, Kiersey, to a large extent, his temperament sorter and so on is more in line with the... Uh, um, Aristotle-like style. I think Helen Fisher is probably a bit more as well in line with that Aristotle-like style. Whereas things like Carl Jung, well, Carl Jung's, yeah, yeah. but MBTI, um, 
some of the ways in which Carl Jungian, modern day Carl Jungian approaches do things. Socionics most definitely is much more in a Plato like style, very TI, very much here's a model where everything's consistently in all these places and so on. Okay. Um, whatever, you get the point. I think you can see the the pros and cons. TI, the con, of course, is sometimes you have this nice little system, but it doesn't always adhere well to what we actually see. So TI systems like socionics require people to really go out into the world and observe things and see, are we really seeing what the model says we're supposed to be seeing? Is everything slotted and fitting in right or is it not? More TE systems can be a little too loose and that you're seeing a lot of stuff, but are you really predicting very well what's going to happen? Um, can you put it in a nice, clean package that we can easily understand, some kind of a structure we can understand? That's where a TE starts to fall short a little bit. All right. So I think that's pretty much about it. That was just something I wanted to throw out there. Um, as always, let me know what you think, like, subscribe, uh, leave your comments and, uh, what you think with Aristotle and Plato, because they're rather interesting, fun philosophers to cover. They're some of my favorites. So anyway, so until the next time.